Okay, welcome everybody to the episode two of the quantum science seminar. Today is going to be all about quantum computing. And uh, uh, again, to remind everybody, the way uh, this works is that um, you're welcome to ask questions and uh, we uh, would like you to submit these questions via email to quantum science seminar at gmail.com. You can also use the YouTube live stream to uh, type in your question, but by email is a bit easier. And we will try to take a break somehow in halfway through the talk and start to answer some of your questions and then do another question session at the very end. Um, please note again on YouTube, if it says you're streaming it live, that means you're seeing it 20 to 30 seconds later than what we're seeing. And with this, I would like to hand over to Thomas to introduce our speaker today. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Quantum Science Seminar. And for me, it's personally a great pleasure to introduce Roy Oseri, whom I met the first time, I think, in 2014, when he was a visiting professor in Innsbruck. So uh, a brief introduction for Roy. So he finished his thesis in 2003 at Weizmann, working on BECs, cold atoms, and spectroscopy. I uh, assume his spectroscopy background motivated him to then go to NIST and work with Dave Vineland, where he got to learn the positive side of charged ions, and, and he remained faithful to trapped ions. So when he returned to, to Weizmann and became a professor there, he's still pursuing ion trap physics, uh, spectroscopy clocks, and he's complementing these ideas with quantum computing, which he's going to present um, this time. So it's a pleasure to introduce and welcome Roy. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, and thank you guys for putting together this lovely series of seminars. It's, it's great, especially at a time like this. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is about to introduce the basic toolbox of trapped ion quantum computing, and then try to convince you why scaling up trapped ion quantum computing to the tens and hundreds of qubits is really a coherent control problem. Um, it's not an easy coherent control problem, but it's an, it's an interesting coherent control problem. And I believe it's, it's also, also solvable. Okay, so let's, let's get started. Um, the system that uh, we're working with are crystals of trapped atomic ions. They're laser cooled. Modern ion traps, these are RF pole traps, are uh, made, they're fabricated using electrodes on substrates, and these are microfabricated electrodes, so typical sizes here are in the tens and the hundreds of, of micrometer. And these microfabrication techniques allow for the, for the building of rather complicated electrode structures. What you see here are two examples of a trap that was made at ETH and another trap that was made by Sandia National Lab. The ions are trapped either hovering above these surfaces or in between the electrodes. And what you see here is a fluorescence image of three trapped ions. Typical distances between ions in a crystal are in the few micrometer. We laser cool them to the microkelvin range. Um, we encode qubits. So we use these for the purpose of, of quantum computing. We encode qubits in the internal levels of these ions. These can be either um, microwave split levels such as Zeeman or hyperfine transitions, or they can, these can also be different electronic levels that are separate by optical transition frequencies. The way we interface our qubits, the way we implement gates, the way we do readout, all those are done using the interface or the interaction of either lasers or microwaves, in any, in any case, electromagnetic fields with these trapped ions. So to understand the way, uh, the way quantum gates are being carried out, we have to look a little bit into the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with trapped ions or with harmonically trapped bound particles. So for a single ion, uh, we can write down a Hamiltonian that we would be composed out of a free Hamiltonian plus some interaction term, the interaction uh, with the electromagnetic field. The free Hamiltonian would, would encode, would, would be that of a single qubit and then the harmonic oscillator degrees of freedom, these would be the harmonically external degrees of freedom of, of that trapped ion. And the interaction term, the interaction with the electromagnetic field would have some coupling strength. We call that the Rabi frequency, a sigma X operator, which can be written as a combination of a spin lowering and spin raising operators. 
And then the time dependence of the electromagnetic field, the electromagnetic field oscillates at some frequency omega, but it also has some spatial variation. It has a Kx term here, and the x in, the, in this cosine is an electromagnet, is a, is a quantum mechanical operator. It's written as a superposition, a combination of, of the creation and annihilation operator of a phonon in the harmonic motion of, of the trapped ion. So the way the, the uh, interaction with the electromagnetic field works, it couples both to spin, but it also couples to the motion of the trapped ion. So what we do usually when we have a time dependent Hamiltonian or interaction term, we move into the interaction representation and we get rid of terms that oscillate at high frequencies. This is the rotating wave approximation. And we get an, an, an expression that looks like this. Again, we have a coupling term, a coupling strength, a Rabi frequency, a spin raising operator, and then a phase factor which oscillates between the momentum and the position of the harmonic oscillator uh, at, the trap, at the trap frequency. And then of course we have the, uh, the residual term of the electromagnetic radiation, which is now oscillating at the detuning of the electromagnetic radiation with, with these transitions. Now I can take this exponent and expand it in, in a Tyler series, and I get different uh, order terms uh, with higher, uh, higher um, exponents of the trap frequency. Now I know that the only terms I care about are stationary terms, which means that the only terms that I will get are terms where the detuning of my electromagnetic radiation equals exactly an integer multiple of, of the harmonic trap frequency. Okay, so I'm only, get, I'm only gonna get stationary terms which would contribute to evolution every time my detuning is an integer number of the trap frequency. So let's look at three of these terms. Uh, the first term would be that of the zero product of the, of the harmonic frequency, which means I'll be in resonance with a, uh, with a unity term in the expansion. This is the carrier transition, and this is the regular way we think about electromagnetic radiation coupled to a, a, to a two-level system. I have some coupling strength. This is a Debye-Waller factor, which is just a prefactor that we're not going to discuss now. And then a sigma x or a sigma y operator, depending on the phase difference between the electromagnetic radiation and the evolution of my, of my spin. But I also have additional terms. Um, whenever, for example, my detuning is minus one times the trap frequency, I will be on resonance with, again, some term that would couple with the Rabi frequency to the qubit. But then every time a spin is being uh, raised, that would be accompanied by taking out one motional quanta from the harmonic oscillator and vice versa. This is a Jane's, the well-known Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian from quantum optics. Whereas if my uh, detuning is such that I'm detuned by one motional frequency from this transition, I'm going to get the blue sideband. And the blue sideband, every time the spin is raised, that would be accompanied by a creation of a phonon in the trap. This would be the, uh, the anti-James Cummings Hamiltonian. So if I'll scan my laser frequency across a transition, I'm going to get a very strong carrier response, but I'll also see motional sidebands every time my uh, electromagnetic radiation frequency moves across one of these sideband resonances. So here is how uh, experimental data looks like. If I'll scan my laser frequency across, for example, here, a narrow quadruple transition in strontium plus ions, the spectrum I'll see is this spectrum, I'll see the strong carrier response in the center, but also blue sidebands and red sidebands. The reason, by the way, I'm seeing two sidebands on each side is because my trap is not spherically symmetric. I have axial modes of motion. Uh, the axial direction is a bit softer, so the frequency is lower, but I also have radial motion, which the radial direction, uh, along the radial direction, the ion is bound tighter, and that's why the frequency is a little bit higher. Here is one example uh, of the way I can use these sideband transitions. For example, I can use this sideband transition to cool the ion to the ground state. If I pulse my electromagnetic radiation on the red sideband and I keep on optically pumping my ion to the ground state over and over again, after doing that several times, I'm gonna extract all the phonons from the trap 
and my ion would be cooled to the ground state. And the way I know that my ion was cooled to the ground state is that if before I ground state cooled, I see both a red and a blue sideband. After I ground state cooled, my red sideband is gone, meaning I cannot extract more phonons from the trap. Um, at this point, we can cool our ions to temperatures which are in the micro Kelvin or, or even below, really. Okay, so the business we're, we're in is, is building quantum computers. So the first thing we need to do uh, is perform single qubit gates. And the way we perform single qubit gates is by pulsing our electromagnetic radiations on the carrier transition and rotate our qubit between up and down. Uh, if we're using lasers to this end, then we can actually focus the electromagnetic radiation such that it interacts with one ion in a few ion chain. This here is an example of a four ion chain and I can, I can focus my radiation such that interaction occurs only with the first ion in the chain or the second ion in the chain, third ion, fourth ion and so forth. And you can see that the cross stock with neighboring ions is rather small. So single qubit rotations are rather, are a rather well controlled operation in trapped ion quantum computing. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the state of the art, the lowest uh, error that has been reported in the literature as far as I know uh, for single qubit rotations. Uh, both this, these data sets are from the from uh, Dave Lucas group at, at Oxford. And you can see that either using uh, Raman transitions with laser beams or microwave fields, uh, the air in single qubit rotations is very small. In the case of Raman fields, the air can be as low as 10 to the minus four, and it's actually limited by spontaneous photon scattering. So it's limited by the quantum mechanical limit, if you like, to this operation. With microwave fields, this limitation is no longer there. Um, and uh, errors as low as one part per million have been reported. The difficulty with microwave fields is that it's not as easy to focus them down to uh, interact with a single qubit, but not interact with other qubits due to their long, long wavelength. Okay, so um, we're building quantum computers. We have single qubit rotations at hand, but in order to have a universal gate, uh, set of quantum gates, we also need to be able to entangle our, our ions. And I think that the working horse for trapped ion entanglement in the, in the past decade or so has been uh, the molmer sorensen gate. Uh, Molmer, I think, is our speaker uh, two weeks from now. Um, and the molmer sorensen gate works the following way. Um, in order to drive entangling transitions in ion, rather than uh, radiating our ions with a monotone of electromagnetic radiation, we shine our ions with uh, a bichromatic field containing two frequencies. Now we choose these two frequencies in the following way. So first, the sum of these two frequencies matches a collective transition between both ions being in the down state and both ions being in the up state. So this is a nice two photon transition core, uh, that, that would generate collective spin rotations. And these two uh, fields are off resonant with a single qubit excitation, such that their frequency is very close to the red and blue sidebands of the transition that we just discussed. And they're detuned by a small detuning psi zero. Okay, so spectrally, how does it look? If I have two ions in the trap, I have two motional modes and I park my electric magnetic radiation with two tones that are a little bit off resonance with one of the red and the blue sideband of one of these modes. Um, I can again write my Hamiltonian in the interaction representation. And what I get is an interaction Hamiltonian that has a uh, coupling to a collective spin and conditioned on the collective spin state, I see that I have uh, a displacement, a force acting. So a displacement either on the uh, position of the harmonic oscillator or the momentum of the harmonic oscillator. So what I have here in the Hamiltonian is a spin dependent, and this time it's a global spin dependent force acting on the harmonic oscillator. So if we write down the time evolution operator under this Wilmer Sorensen gate, what we get is as expected uh, displacement operator 
a displacement which depends on the spin. So we displace both the position and the momentum of the harmonic oscillator. But we also acquire a geometric phase. And that geometric phase now depends on the global spin state of my two ions. So if I, if I draw the trajectory of this motional mode in phase space, again, we're looking just in one motional modes out of the two motional modes of these two ions, we see that as a function of time, my two ion, my motional mode traverses some path in phase space and acquires a geometric phase, which is proportional to the area that I've encircled in phase space. In order to get a valid entanglement gate, I have two requirements. One requirement is that the trajectory closes at the end of the gate. So both these position uh, and momentum displacements are zero at the end of the gate. And also that the area that I'm circled in units of H is exactly pi over two. If, if these two conditions are met and I start with, my, with both my ions in the down uh, qubit state, after the gate ends, I'm gonna be in an equal superposition of both ions in the down state and both ions being in the up state. Okay, how does this look in the lab? So this is again, data from two strontium plus ions starting with both ions in the down state. So the SS state, this is again, the electric quadruple S to D transition in strontium plus. When the gate starts, both ions with 100% probability are in the SS state. But after about 150 microseconds, I see an equal probability of finding them in the SS state and equal pro uh, and in the DD state, and roughly zero probability of finding them in a single excitation state. How do I know that this is an, indeed an entangled superposition and not a statistical mixture of SS and DD? I rotate my spin states and I look for interference fringes. And what you see here is the parity of the two ion state as a function of the phase of the rotation. And by measuring the contrast of these nice interference fringes, I can say what is the fidelity with which I generated this uh, superposition of SS and DD states. Um, this is great, but um, when I'm trying to drive these gates, these gates are sensitive to errors that I have in gate parameters. So for example, if I miss a little bit my gate time, so my drive time, I'm gonna get an error. If I miss a little bit my trap frequency, again, I'm gonna get a, an error in my, in my target state or in my operation. Same is true for laser detuning and laser intensity. And what I'd like to do in the next uh, few minutes is describe quickly how we can use quantum engineering methods, coherent control methods in order to mitigate these poss possible errors. So again, looking at the molmer sorensen gate, we said that what we do is we take a gate that uses two tones, two frequencies that match a collective spin rotation. Um, now, what happens if we add more tones to our drive? So rather than using just two tones, we add more tones. So we add multiples of that little size zero detuning, each with an amplitude ri. So if we zoom in on the spectral region here, we see that this spectral region splits into a series of tones. Uh, it's rather easy to see that we can still drive a gate this way provided that still at the end of the gate, the trajectory that we drive closes. And that translates into a condition on this psi naught. That psi naught has to be two pi over the gate time. And as long as I'm using multiples of this fundamental frequency unit, I'm fine. And I'm still fine, regardless of the shape of the, of the path that I traverse to, through phase space, as long as the area that I accumulated is pi over two, I'm fine. And a condition on the area says that the amplitude squared of all, the sum of amplitude squared of all these uh, tones divided by the tone integer has to be equal one. As long as I, I fulfill these two requirements, I have a valid entanglement gate. So now instead of having a single molmer sorensen gate, I have a family of gates, each characterized by a series of NIs. These are the integers and the amplitudes that I give to each one of those. The time evolution operator is gonna be the same time evolution operator. So again, I'm gonna have some position displacement and momentum displacement. And I'm going to acquire a geometric phase, which would be proportional to the area that I encircled in phase space. 
All these displacements in geometric phase, of course, are spin dependent. They depend on the collective spin on these two ions. And now by choosing one gate out of this family, I can really draw my favorite shape through phase space. Here are three examples of valid gates, the regular circular molmer sorensen gate, a cardioid shape gate, a really funky looking green gate. Um, I can really drive my entanglement gates in multiple ways. And this is great because now that I have extra degrees of freedom, I have an overdetermined system. I can choose many, many gates. I actually have a continuous family of gates. Now I can add more constraints and by satisfying these constraints, confine to a gate that would perform what I'd like it to perform. And the constraints I add are constraints that are meant to robustify the gate. So I can write down the gate fidelity with an analytic expression. Um, those of you who are quick will notice that the gate fidelity when my uh, both position and momentum displacements are zero at the end of the gate. So that exponent is one. Uh, this exponent is also one and the area that I encircle is pi over two. So that sine function is also one, the fidelity I get is zero, uh, is one. But now what happens if one of my control parameters is off? If one of my control parameters is off, then I can take this fidelity function and expand it according to this control parameter. This control parameter can be the gate time. This control par parameter can be the, the laser intensity. This control parameter can be anything really. So now I can expand the error that I'm getting in my gate. And I can use the over-determined system I have in order to find gates that null these errors order by order. Let me give you two quick examples. So one example is killing the time error in my, in my gate. In order to kill the time error in my gate, um, I can add more tones to my drive, expand the fidelity, and I can see that I can kill the time error in my gate uh, all the way up to an order of 2n, where n is the number of tones that I use. For n equal 2, I'm going to get rid of the quadratic term in the error. In this case, the solution would be two opposite sine amplitudes. And the shape that I'll draw through phase space instead of a circular shape would be the shape, a heart looking shape. So this would be a cardioid. Um, and this is uh, data from the lab showing the evolution of the different spin states as a function of the gate time. In a regular molmer sorensen gate, you'll see that the air is indeed quadratic around the perfect gate time. Whereas if I choose to get rid of the airs, I'm gonna get an air which is a fourth order, a quartic uh, response around the perfect gate time. Another quick example we can go to is uh, what happens if we have now two errors, an error in the gate time and an error in the gate frequency. Let's say we want gates that are robust to both. Then we need to add another tone and devise a gate which is much more robust to both errors. What you see here is experimental data looking at the gate fidelity as a function of the trap frequency. And you'll notice that we can vary the gate the trap frequency almost by, by as much as, the, as half of our gate detuning and still the fidelity remains pretty close to 100%. The shape that we draw in phase space is now this funky curled shape. Uh, the area that we encircled is still of course pi over two and at the end of the gate, motion is disentangled from spin. So that was a, a, a quick example of how we can use coherent control methods, how we can use quantum engineering in order to improve on the performance of our two qubit gate fidelities. To conclude that part, um, what I'd like to show you again are the, as far as I know, the state of the art two qubit gate fidelities. Uh, this is again data from the Oxford group and this is data from the NIST group. Both uh, data sets use, uh, use Raman lasers and both report errors which are in the low 10 to the minus three so one part per thousand error in two qubit entanglement gates. So um, I think this might be a good place to stop before we move to what happens to when we try to scale these uh, quantum computers to more qubits and ask uh, whether we have questions at this point. 
Yeah, Rui, um, uh, there are maybe two. Um, so one would be uh, one question by Manuel Morgado. How is it possible uh, to check that the Müller, Sorensen, Gate family is universal? Maybe you can say a few words to that. Well, universal, the, the, the condition for a universal gate set, uh, for example, is having single qubit rotations. Um, and then you can ask yourself which single qubit rotations, but we can pretty much perform any single qub qubit rotation with reasonable fidelities. And then having two qubit entanglement gates. Now, once you've proved that your, uh, that your Molmer Sorensen is equivalent to a controlled knot, for example, under single qubit rotations, you've proved that it is valid for a universal gate set. All this continuous family of gates is really identical in terms of the output, in terms of the output product to a regular Molmer Sorensen and then and, and hence valid as part of a universal gate set. Okay, thanks. Uh, and there's one more that's uh, a bit more technical to what you showed. Um, so um, Uwe von Lübke asks, why does the error for the Raman single qubit gate go up again when you increase the gate time? Well, it's, it's really a balance. So it's the single qubit, uh, it's, it's really a balance of having um, the, you know, as far as, as far as you detune away your Raman beams from the transition, uh, then you win in terms of, you win in terms of the, uh, of the, of the, um, of spontaneous photon scattering. So when you actually, if, if gate time goes, goes down for a given laser intensity, that means you detuned your, your, your Raman laser closer to the transition, and then you suffer more from spontaneous photon scattering. So spontaneous photon scattering is responsible for the short gate, single qubit gate fundamental error. When you go to longer gates, you suffer from other, from other reasons. Okay, thanks um, for answering those two. I think we should go on now and to keep the break short. Okay, so in order to build a quantum computer, having two ions is not sufficient. And what you need to do is put more ions in your trap. What you see here is a crystal of three ions. And again, using uh, techniques in which we focus our lasers only on the ions we'd like, we can choose the ions that we would like to participate in a given entanglement gate. So we can choose ions one and two, for example, and entangle only those two. There's a little bit of a complication. If I have three ions in my trap, that means I have three modes of motion. That means I need to choose one of them. I can't, so in this case, I choose the center of mass motion, for example, but that's okay. The gate would work slower because I have a heavier effective mass to push around when I try to push the ion crystal. So I'll, I'll get a hit of a square root in the number of ions in the gate time. I can mitigate that by increasing the laser power, but then if I increase the laser power, I increase the off resonance coupling I have to other modes of motion or to the carrier transition. But even with all these caveats, this approach still works for a small number of ions. So if I look at what the trapped ion community, the machines that were built in, in the last decade or so, there are various examples. This here is a, is a nature paper from a couple of years ago coming from Chris Monroe's group uh, in which relatively small registers of I would say five to 10 ions have been uh, put to work. And these machines work rather well with, with pretty good fidelities and many quantum algorithms and protocols have been demonstrated using these machines, starting from quantum chemistry calculations to grow a search algorithm, different quantum error correction protocols and, and many more. Um, but small quantum computers are not enough. If we'd like to really build a, quantum, a meaningful quantum computer, a quantum computer that can reach uh, quantum advantage over regular classical computers, we need to reach much larger number of ions. And to that end, two architectures have been proposed for scaling up that try to interconnect these small modules of quantum computer. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna describe these in, in great detail. I'm just gonna mention that one of these architectures that was initially proposed by Kilpinski, Monroe and Wineland in, in 2002 
uh, is a CCD approach. So it's it's a it's a um, it's a um, uh, multiplexed array of ion traps on a chip. Each one of these ion traps is a small trapped ion quantum computer, but then you can shut lines around between these trapped uh, trap regions in order to build a large scale quantum computer. The other approach is an approach that uses, uh, again, an array or multiple small scale trapped ion quantum computers, and then interconnects those through photonic interconnects. And the photonic interconnects uh, rely on Hongu Mandel interference. This is a similar idea to the Neil Laflamme Milburn way of performing photonic quantum computing. Here you also rely on the fact that these photons are entangled with the uh, ions that scattered them. So by, by uh, seeding entanglement between these different elementary logical units, you can create again a large scale quantum computer. This approach was was proposed by Monroe and Lumin Duane uh, 10 years ago or so. But none of these, I, I, I have to say, none of these approaches so far has been able to interconnect more than two at most small scale quantum computers. So while these ideas are promising, right now, building large scale quantum computers with these approaches was, would take a long time. And that's why similarly to other quantum computing approaches, the trapped ion quantum computer uh, community is trying to take a NISC approach, a noisy intermediate scale quantum computing approach. Let's try and put more and more ions in the chain, trap chains of 50 to 100 ions or even more, and then try to stretch the previous ideas that I outlined and make them work on these long, long chains. Now we know that we can't reach a quantum computer of 1,000 ions this way, but we, maybe we can reach a trapped ion quantum computer of 100 ions. And we know that because the speed up of quantum computing is exponential, even reaching 60 ions would be sufficient provided that the fidelity is high enough in order to reach quantum advantage. We know that Google with their Sycamore um, uh, uh, superconducting qubit computer were able to demonstrate quantum advantage using only 53 uh, qubits. So if we are able to build these 60 to 100 trapped ion quantum computing, we'll be able to carry out interesting quantum simulations, maybe reach quantum advantage with quantum computing, but kind of really stretch the previous ideas to these numbers of ion chains. Now, there are several challenges on the way. Now, instead of few motional modes, we're going to have hundreds of motional modes. Uh, and these hundreds of motional modes are also going to spectrally crowd, meaning that it'll be much harder to focus on, on one motional mode and get rid of all the others. Now with two qubit gates, and that's true for any large scale quantum computer, we'll need more and more operations. For example, in Shor's factoring algorithm, the number of operations you need scales as the number of qubits to the cube power. But on the other hand, we know that since effectively we need to deal with higher weight uh, chains, crystals, the gate time would scale down as one over the square root of the number of ion qubits we have. On the, to make things even worse, we know that for certain entangled states, the fidelity that we get, we get drops down, uh, sometimes even quadratically with the number, of, the number of qubits that we have. What you see here is data that was uh, taken by our, uh, by our kind host, uh, Tommy Montz, a few years ago, showing that the fidelity with which uh, few ion qubit entangled states can be prepared and the time it, we can maintain them coherent goes down as the number of qubits squared. So we're really between the sledge and the hammer here. We can always increase our laser power, but that means we'll increase our off resonance coupling either to the carrier or to the motional modes. So we really need a clever way in order to make all these uh, challenges mitigated. And one possible remedy is to use gates that talk to multiple ion qubits in parallel, meaning that we wouldn't need to concatenate these two qubit gates one after the other. We'll be able to, to perform them all in a single step. And to do that, use all modes of motion of the ion crystal, all these hundreds of, of motional modes in, in, together in, in, in a way which would constructively, constructively interfere. This way we can use strong laser power, shorten the gate time, and not worry about off resonance coupling because all modes participate anyway. So how would that come about? So as, as we started off the Molmer-Sorensen gate for two ions, we have two motional modes 
and then two tones with which we drive the Molmer-Sorensen interaction. If we have many, many more ions, we'll have many more emotional modes, but then we'll need to pack many more tones. So again, we're going to generalize the Molmer-Sorensen into a multi-mode Molmer-Sorensen interaction. Again, the Hamiltonian would generalize to a spin-dependent force shape. Now the collective spin is not just going to be a two ion spin, it's going to be the collective spin on the full crystal. So these JYJ operators would be spin operators that are given by all the Pauli operators of the ions in the crystal vector product with a normal mode vector of, of, the, ve of the mode that we're considering. Uh, and for each of the normal modes, we're going to have again, a position and momentum displacements that would be determined by the sum of action of all these tones. You see every cosine here oscillates at the frequency of one of these tones. Um, and then a phase factor that looks like normal mode frequency. So again, we have similarly to the regular molmer sorensen a collective spin dependent force. And that's why if we look at the time evolution operator, that looks very similar to the time evolution operator that we had in the two ion case. We're going to have a spin dependent collective spin dependent force for each one of those modes and a geometric phase that would, would be acquired depending on the collective spin state in each one of these normal modes. And the total time evolution operator is going to be the product over all normal modes because the operators in different normal modes commute with each other we don't have to worry about, particularly worry about ordering of operators in this, in this product. So for every normal mode, we're going to have a trajectory, which is uh, traversed through phase space. And again, in order to get the gate, it's a similar phase space intuition. We need to make sure that all these trajectories close at the end of the gate. So this would be the constraint. All the fj's and gj's at the end of the gate are equal zero. And that's actually an easy constraint to satisfy. It's a linear constraint in the amplitudes that we use for the different tones. Now, we also need to make sure that we acquired the correct geometric phase. So here is an example. I'm showing the all-to-all -all coupling scheme. Here I'm trying to couple all the spins of the ions in the crystal to all other spins in the ions in the crystal, which means I need to work on the normal mass, uh, on the center of mass mode. Now it turns out, and I'm not going to go through the algebra, that the condition for all-to-all -all coupling is such that the difference between the geometric phase I acquire in the center of mass mode, which I denote here as mode one, and all other modes is pi over two. Okay. Now this constraint is a little harder to satisfy. It's a quadratic constraint. And trying to optimize quadratic constraint problems is known in computer science to be an NP-hard problem. Um, I find it a little bit ironic that in order to build a quantum computer, you need to solve an optimization problem, which is NP-hard for classical computers, particularly since quantum computers are at least uh, have, have the hope of being able through QAOA and other algorithms to optimize very difficult classical optimization problems. The optimistic part of that is that since we're only talking about a few tens of ions, and we do not necessarily need to optimize these, these problems perfectly, but only approximately, this optimization is still possible. And here are a few examples. This is a solution uh, we did in our group of finding the right multi-mode gate for six ions using the axial modes of the ion chain. What you see here is the gate error due to off resonance coupling to uh, other modes as a function of the gate time. And you can see that when we're trying to drive regular molmer sorensen gates, this is the yellow line here, when the gate time becomes comparable to the trap frequency, we strongly couple to all other modes. And you see that the gate error goes to one, 10 to the zero. So these, these gates are useless. However, when we optimize our multi-modes gate, at least in theory, we can find gates all the way down to only a few trap oscillation times that still have ridiculously low errors due to coupling to off resonantly coupling either to the carrier or to other emotional modes. You can also see that the laser power that we need in order to drive these gates 
scales as we would expect is one over the gate time. So we don't need to pay huge overhead in terms of laser power. So for some reason I don't have a, my presentation is stuck, I apologize. I need to reopen my presentation, sorry. Are we back to the right? Okay. So how do these, how do these gates look like? So we need, uh, we have six signs. We need 10, 22 tones. These are the different spectral tone. If I look at the time variation of the electromagnetic field that drive the gate, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Looks like a random, random field, but it's not random. It was carefully optimized. If I look at the amplitude of each of the no normal modes that I have, I see that they all follow a pretty funky shape, but at the end of the gate, uh, they all close, so they're all back at zero. And if I look at the geometric phase that I acquired, I see that the center of mass mode has acquired the phase, which is exactly pi over two different from all the other, all the other modes, which was the condition that I looked for. If I look at the path that I traverse through phase space, these are really funky shapes. This particular gate time is about at 30 times the, uh, the trap frequency. So it's, it's a pretty fast gate. Um, we repeated this exercise for 12 ions. I'm not going to go through the details uh, too, too carefully here. You need, you need about 40 tones. Um, we designed the gate such that it's robust to timing errors, to normal mode frequency drifts. So it's a pretty useful gate. Uh, again, all the normal modes go back to zero at the end of the gate. And the geometric phase that I acquired is, is exactly what I needed it to be. Uh, in the last year or so, there have been a couple of demonstrations of such multimode gates, not following the, the, exactly the ideas that I outlined, but some other optimization schemes. What I'm showing here is a gate that was uh, performed in the group of, of Chris Monroe at the uh, JQI. Uh, this here is for five ions, five normal modes. The optimization was done in the time domain rather than frequency domain. But still, you can see that all normal modes participate in the gate. And experimentally, you can actually entangle any pair of ions you'd like in this five ion crystal. Uh, in this case, it's one and four and two and three. And in this case, it's one and four and two and five with reasonable fidelities. So we believe that these, these uh, methods are actually useful in order to try and push trapped ion quantum computing technology all the way to a couple of dozen or maybe tens or even a hundred trapped ions in a single crystal. So to summarize and maybe uh, give you a little bit of the take home message, I think the status now of trapped ion quantum computers is that we as a uh, trapped ion quantum computing community can build high fidelity, uh, small universal quantum machines and execute quantum algorithms on few uh, uh, trapped ion quantum uh, qubits. And we're working on increasing these to a few tens of ion qubits. Um, one long-term uh, path that the trapped ion quantum community is taking is trying to scale up these uh, using architectures in which these small modules are interconnected. But the more intermediate scale, uh, intermediate term goal is using these large ion crystals and use coherent control optimization techniques in order to drive, again, our favorite high fidelity quantum gates on these long chains. This is not an easy problem, yet it's possible. Uh, if you look, for example, here on our 12 ion trajectories that are path through phase space, these are pretty awesome looking. Um, and we believe that um, this work towards 100 qubit trapped ion universal quantum computer that we do in our group as well uh, would, y would yield useful machines in the, in the near term. So I'd like to end um, by thanking uh, all the members of the Weizmann Trapped Iron uh, team. 
Uh, the folks in the upper row are the people who work on the trapped ion quantum computing effort and the data that I've shown from our group came from these guys. Many of the ideas that I've shown have come from uh, Yotam Shapira and, Adi, and, and worked through, through the help of Adi Stern, who is a theorist at the Weizmann Institute. I'd also like to thank all of our funding agencies and you for your attention. And thank you, Roy, for your really, really good overview and presentation about how far we can get with trapped ions and the levels of fidelity we can achieve. Um, with that, I'm handing over to Christian to pose the questions by the audience. Christian, we don't hear you. Yeah, many questions coming in. Sorry, I had, <laughs> had to handle everything. So uh, now I'm not muted. Uh, so thanks for it. Um, uh, let me start maybe with a, a bit uh, a question that connects to the efforts in quantum computing uh, worldwide. Uh, and that's by Abir uh, Weichner. Um, and the question is, some companies like Honeywell are investing a lot in a six qubit trapped ion quantum computer with a quantum volume as high as 64. Can we see, can we see how this uh, is compared to the research at NIST and Oxford and others, I guess? Well, I'm, I'm not, so I'm, you know, I'm not at Honeywell, so it's very difficult for me to tell what Honeywell plans are. I know that Honeywell are working on the shuttling type uh, architecture uh, in which small mixed species ion, ion crystals are trapped in certain uh, trapping zone and then shuttle around. Um, so I think with this, this architecture has long-term promising prospects. I think that will, it'll take time until this architecture really hits hundreds of qubits. I also know that Honeywell has a shorter term prospect, uh, a project with prospects that looks at generating cluster states uh, with ions that are not entangled simultaneously. So in other words, using the same ions over and over again in a cluster state, which um, is, you know, the, the, it's the same ions in the same cluster state. It's a little similar to ideas that come from the world of photonic qubits in which some photons in the cluster state have long ago been buried in the, in the photo detector. So, the number of photons that are alive in the in the in the this cluster state are small, but then again, I think people from Honeywell would be able to answer this more more precisely. Okay, thanks. Um, so I, there are quite some questions actually about the multi-tone and multi-mode Mölmerzerns and gates. So uh, maybe um, I start with one from uh, Wen Chao Ge. Um, for the multi-tone Mölmer-Serensen gate, what's the cost of the protocol besides, besides the carefully designed pulse? So what is basically the disadvantage that comes with this scheme? Well, um, so in, in, there's not much to it. So for example, the, 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 the methods that I described here do not even require individual addressing. We can actually tailor different spin coupling schemes, and I haven't, I haven't described those in, in at all here, by using one global beam that addresses the entire crystal. So in principle, there's not, there's not much, much disadvantage. Um, the difficulty really comes from the fact that the gates really slow down as a function of the number of ions. So the gates would still be square root of n slower, which means you would still need to come up with higher intensity lasers. That's, um, that's, never, that's never easy. You do enjoy the advantage of not having to worry about this high intensity pulses coupling to other modes or to other transitions because you already took care of that in the way you optimize the gate. Um, then there are the other difficulties of being able to maintain multiple ion superpositions coherent over a long time in the face of different noises that you have in your system. But in terms of carrying out the gates, I would say you mainly have advantages, not many disadvantages. Of course, you need to find the correct solution, be able to, to tailor your spectrum, or in other words, control in the time domain the way your, your 
electromagnetic field behaves uh, with reasonable accuracy. Okay, great. With that answer, actually, you, you covered uh, a few other questions uh, in this uh, direction. Um, there's one that goes in the direction that you just mentioned and uh, advertised that all the modulations are kind of global from uh, DD Lightweight. And uh, that is uh, basically the question, how sensitive is this scheme actually to stray fields and curvature that are not global over the string and that will change over time? And he suspects that you run into another hard optimization game. <laughs> so hi, Didi. Uh, great question, as expected. Um, so stray fields, uh, I'm not sure what we can do about curve curvature of the of the. If what you have is a curvature in your laser beam, you could try and optimize your gate such that at least. Uh, partly, maybe not fully, but to a large extent, you will be able to compensate for it by uh, playing with the, the exact modes that you use. So you could play, you could excite a, a superposition of modes that makes up for the non-uniformity of the beam across the crystal. That is, of course, given that you know what that non-uniformity is, that you've characterized it. Uh, I'm not sure you can do much with, with stray fields. And if these things vary over time, you better track the way they vary. Otherwise, I think that would be a problem. OK. Um, uh, another question in this direction from John Bollinger. And that's uh, the question, where are the advantages uh, to do the, multi the multiplexing in frequency domain, so your multi-tone approach, um, compared to doing this in time, so time multiplexing? Well, it's the, the advantage or disadvantage are all in the optimization, are on the optimization end of, of doing this. It has nothing to do really with the implementation side. It's really a way of a language that you describe it. The nice thing about uh, working in the spectral domain is that you can, you can find out a couple of short, shortcuts in the calculation. For example, you can work again with harmonics of the, of the gate time and you know that you're you're already okay when you do that. So that saves that saves some some time in terms of the optimization runtime. So I would say it's all in the optimization end of things uh, that you win by by doing this analysis in the in the spectral domain. Okay, maybe one last one in this direction. Um, uh, Pavel uh, Homo is uh, worrying if there are hardware limitations actually run into. So classical hardware like um, uh, arbitrary waveform generators, uh, can they still do that or are you seeing limits? No, we're not, we're not, seeing, we're not seeing limits there because if you look at the, at the dynamic range we need, the, the distance between our tones is always one over the gate time. We're not gonna have anything denser than one over the gate time. That's going back to the advantage of, of analyzing this in the spectral domain, which means we don't need spectral resolution, which is way finer than that. And then if you look at the width, the spectral width that we need, that would be determined by the spectral width of the motional modes, which again is not gonna be huge. So the dynamic range you need over that spectrum is, is not gonna be horrible. It's gonna be on par with the number of, the number of modes that you use. So arbitrary waveform generators, you know, re decent arbitrary waveform generators uh, can certainly pull this, these, these techniques off, I would say. Okay, so now maybe um, we leave the technical side of the, of the gates. Um, and then there was actually a question by Andrew Daly. Um, and that question was, um, if it, uh, how do you see actually the usefulness of two approaches for optimizing uh, your gates. So one, you do that theoretically based on error models you have and then implement, implement the optimized gate protocol. Or two, you jump into the lab uh, and try to optimize directly on the lab control hardware. It's a good question. I, I, think, the, the, I think that the reason uh, these problems are NP hard their NP-hard optimization problems is simply because the combinatorial 
number of, of, you know, even if you digitize the amplitudes in each of the modes, the combi combinatorial number of options that you have there is really huge. That's, that's the reason these things are NP hard. So I think that in theory, um, in theory, I think both in theory and in the lab, you'll need to find some smart algorithm that searches through these things. And then the question really is, how fast can you run the gate? Uh, so that, you know, the, the, the optimization would work by coming up with, with a certain gate, then running it, coming up with a gate, then running it. I think that so far, silicon is still, running the gate in silicon is still faster than running the gate in the lab. And that's why if I have to run over many different gates in order to find the optimum, I, at this point, I would still do it in silicon rather than doing it uh, in the lab. Okay, I think uh, that's it with the question we want to ask uh, for day, today. And I'm sorry if uh, I couldn't ask uh, all of them, um, but I would give back now to Tommy. Well then, um, Roy, thank you very much for your really, really good presentation and giving us an outlook on how we can get with the gate fidelities. Um, I guess my people will poke me now about the AWGs and getting all the frequencies in. Uh, we'll probably come back to you about that. And so uh, on behalf of more than 300 people watching your presentation, I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, we are looking forward to have you at some later point in time again. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing. Cheers. No problem. So with that, I'll hand over to Sebastian, who is going to give an outlook for more to come next week. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, so I'd just like to finish this up by uh, giving you a preview. So next week, we will have Derek Chang from ICFO to talk about uh, more fundamental theoretical uh, quantum optics, a very cool topic. And if you want to get notified about um, upcoming talks, and if you want to get it on your calendar, go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com and subscribe to our um, email list. And please subscribe to our Google Calendar. That makes it easy for you. Um, if you have any suggestions for speakers that you would like to hear and people who give uh, great talks, like we heard just now to a very broad audience, um, please let us know, just write us an email. And uh, I would again like to recommend our sister seminar, the AMO seminar uh, or VAMOS. It's at amo-seminar.com every Friday um, at 9 p.m. European time. And the interesting point here is that tomorrow there'll be another talk on trapped ion quantum computing by uh, Dan Slichter. So check that out, please. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us again. And I hope we'll see you next uh, week again. Same time, same place. Thank you and bye.